Hey everybody, in this lecture, we're gonna be talking about structural geology. Now, some of these concepts we've already talked about in previous lectures, so uh, hopefully some of this is recap. Uh, what we're going to be talking about is why rocks deform. And uh, typically we talk about this when uh, we, we look at how mountains are formed. Uh, we're going to look at some basic structures like faults and folds. Uh, we've already had a lecture all about um, faults, so today we're gonna be talking about some of those other structures. Uh, we're going to be learning about where and why mountain belts form and what processes cause their uplift. And of course, uh, how everything relates to plate tectonics. I don't think there's a lecture where we don't talk about plate tectonics. Uh, so let's, let's dive in. In the previous lecture, we talked about stress and how stress can be applied to rocks in the subsurface. These rocks then deform based on how stresses are applied. So if you remember the, um, the example of uh, using the marshmallow and how you can see how the marshmallow deforms based on where the stress is applied. Uh, those, those are the things that happen in the subsurface and cause some of these subsurface structures. So it's important to uh, keep in mind that stress is a big driver into why structures form in the subsurface. When stress is applied and it um, is exceeds the fracture gradient, that's where we get things like faults but if it's, uh, if it's a slow gradual or if the rocks are um, malleable in some way, that's when we get these folds. So today is more about folds and mountain building. So a reminder is that we talked about faults already, and this is a, a crack, a huge movement of either plates or uh, rocks in uh, the subsurface. And we talked about a few different types of um, faults and, uh, and when there's a, a fast movement along a plane, that's where we typically see earthquakes. Okay, so now today is really talking about folds. So uh, stresses developed during mountain building can cause bending and foliation, and it causes the earth to curve uh, or the subsurface to curve. And uh, when we talk about folds, there's a few vocabulary words that I'm going to use in describing them. The first is limb, hinge, and then axial surface. So let's look at some examples. Okay, so here are those components uh, in an example here. The limbs are the sides of the fold. The hinge is the line along uh, where the fold is the greatest. So in this case, the hinge coincides with the axial plane or the axial surface, and that's the imaginary plane that contains the hinge. So sometimes, uh, so sometimes this is different because the hinge uh, could be where the maximum is, but if it's plunging, then the actual plane will be a little bit different orientation. We're going to see an example of that. So let's go over a few uh, a few structures that we see in the subsurface: anticlines, synclines, monoclines, uh, non-plunging and plunging, and domes and basins. So let's look at some examples. First is an anticline, and this is a fold that has an arch-like shape in which the limbs dip away from the hinge, okay? And a good way to remember anticline is that it looks kind of like an A. So again, if you see it without the letter A here, you can see that this is folded uh, over in itself and it looks a little bit like the letter A. Now the opposite is a syncline, and this is where folds uh, form like a trough. And the way that I try to remember a syncline is that it looks like a sink, sink, Incline? Okay. Well, whatever works for you. Uh, this is how I try to remember the difference between an anticline and a syncline. A monocline, a monocline has the shape of like a, a carpet that's draped over a stair step, and it's not quite folded all the way onto itself like you see in an anticline or syncline, but um, this is where uh, it just has one, one little step in there, and it's usually associated with a fault. So typically we see monoclines where there's faults below, and then this is just the layers above it draping over that uh, displacement. Now I already mentioned plunging versus non-plunging slightly. So uh, where we have um, where we have uh, non-plunging are the examples that I just showed, but a fold can be tilted, and when it's tilted, that's called plunging. 
And so an example here on the right, this is a plunging anticline. And you might be able to see the difference uh, between this and the previous image is that it has been rotated. So our, our hinge and our axial surface are plunging, they're rotated downward. So let me use the edge of this book maybe to help you. So I drew a line on the edge of this book. And if we were to have an anticline, just a straight anticline like, ah, like this, <laughs> Um, you can see that this creates that A shape. Now, if I were to plunge it, now you see the top of my book. You see, uh, you see how this is a little bit difficult to do on camera, but you can now see the top of my textbook. Now, if I were to plunge it the other way, now you see the bottom of my textbook. Uh, and if you were to just be non-plunging, all you would see is really the structure. So that may be a little bit difficult to conceptualize, but hopefully um, you understand that a plunge just has to do with the way that it's rotated. All right, so I'm going to try to draw these and I'm, I apologize in advance. Here's our subsurface cube-ish. Okay, so again, if we have uh, some subsurface layers that look like a syncline, like a sink, we have another layer below it. Say this one also intersects our surface. Let's do one more. Yellow, great. On the side here is the only layer that we would see. And then at the surface, we would see this one, like that. We'd also see the blue at the surface. And again, right here in between, this is our axial surface and that imaginary surface would cut all the way down here. And when we think about three-dimensional space, uh, I guess it's worth noting that I call this dimension the Z space. And uh, perhaps in this direction, this is like our Y. And this direction is our X. So when we talk about representing things in three dimensions, we have the X plane, Y plane, and Z plane. So that's an example of a syncline. Okay, this is my attempt to draw an anticline. So in an anticline, remember, it looks like an A. And if we have a different layer above it, and that layer intersects the surface, if we were to uh, draw what it looks like at the surface, let's try to make this three-dimensional. At the surface, we would see this type of layer, like that, here. And on the side, we'd see this here. And right in the center, this is our axial plane, right in between where these two layers intersect. So this is an example of an anticline. Other structures that we see in the subsurface, they're a little bit harder to just draw, is a dome. And this is a fold in the shape of an overturned bowl. So it looks like, looks like an overturned bowl versus the other side of that is the basin, which is an upright bowl. So we see domes and basins when there are stresses that are occurring in multiple directions, not just two directions to cause one fold, but it's folded in all dimensions. So again, we have a dome, which has an overturned bowl, and then of course a, a basin is shaped like, like an upright bowl. So let's look at some examples in real life. Um, so can you guess what the structure is? What does it look like? Do you see the letter A here? This is an example of an anticline. You can see how these, uh, these are the limbs. And 
where my mouse is going right here, that's the uh, axial surface. That's the point at which there's maximum folding occurring. So this is an example of an anticline. Can you guess what this one looks like? Do you see how this is circular? This is a hint that it's either a dome or a basin. Without knowing too much detail about the subsurface, it's hard to tell the difference. But based on uh, how it's been eroded, this looks like more of a basin. This looks like a bowl to me, as opposed to an overturned bowl. You can see how some uh, erosion has taken place, uh, which means that things uh, of the, in, the internal parts of this structure um, are being eroded away, as opposed to if it were a dome, we'd see more edges being eroded away. Okay, what about here? Well, this looks like a sink to me. This would be a syncline. And for that matter, if we were to look at, um, so this is an aerial view of a dome or a basin here. And again, it looks as though it's a basin to me. But if we were to see the Z plane, if we were to cut this right in half, it would look like a syncline. So just from one view here, uh, without understanding how this extends in all directions, uh, a, a basin or a dome could look like an anticline or a syncline. Um, but without knowing all of the dimensions, it's hard to guess between the two. And in this structure here, we can see that these are the limbs and uh, and this would be the axial plane. And this looks like a sink. So this is a syncline. Can you guess this structure? Again, this is an aerial view. So sometimes it's hard to tell what this uh, structure is. But let's look at it in little pieces. OK, so here is our limbs off to the side. Here is our uh, hinge or our axial surface would be in this direction. And it's plunging. And it uh, it looks like it's plunging because this isn't continuous all the way. It's plunging at, at about this point right here so that the um, the surface of the, uh, or the, the actual structure is, is dipping downward. And it's dipping in this direction and therefore it's not continuous across the entire surface. And so if we were to look at a cross section of that, or a Z slice, if we were to look at the, the front view of this structure, we would see that this resembles an anticline. You can see the A shape here. And so we can guess this based, of, based on uh, what's visible at the surface. So if you have um, different original processes that have taken place, you have rocks that are more resistant to erosion that are visible. And so uh, we see that there's some of these harder sandstones um, that remain, but some of the softer shale has been eroded away. And this gives us a hint as to uh, what shape lies beneath. OK, so how do folds form? They can develop in two different ways. We have flexural slip and passive flow folds. So let's look at both of these. A flexural slip fold is a stack of layer that bends, and the slip occurs between the layers to accommodate the bending without creating gaps. An example of this is if you have playing cards. Get my playing cards out here. So if you have a stack of playing cards, and if you were to bend them, they, they bend in relation to each other. And uh, this is hard to demonstrate on the camera, but when you when you bend a deck of cards, the cards slide with respect to each other. It's not like the the cards are getting um, shorter as as they bend. They're just they're just bending um, with respect to each other, and it it creates uh, it creates these folds. And you can see that in this example down here, the length of this is not getting shorter. They're just stacking on top of each other. And that's uh, what you would expect with a more flexible deck of cards. We also have passive flow folds. 
And this forms when uh, the rock is so soft that it behaves like a plastic and it slowly full flows and folds. So folds develop because different parts of the rock body flow at different rates. And this has to do with the composition. So if you remember when we talk about um, rocks and minerals and how slight variations of composition can, can change the way that they, they flow and therefore fold. So uh, we can see that um, in this example here that uh, the material of the rock deforms at different rates because it has different composition. And if we were to uh, draw a little arrow of how much it flows when it folds, this is where we get these foliation looking things. Uh, and that's because, uh, say for example, the, the composition of this rock, the whitish layers here are um, flowing uh, more quickly or they're easily to flow, more easily to flow than the, uh, and the, the darker color, the more, um, yeah, the darker color composition around it. And we're gonna have an example of that in a second. Okay, so why folds form? So some layers wrinkle or some buckle in response to the compression or that type of stress that hits it. So if there's a train of anticlines and synclines that form when their fold, uh, when their fold hinges are perpendicular to the direction of compression, so if we were to um, take a, a, a piece of paper and you were to apply, <laughs> if you were to apply enough stress, you can see that I have a series of anticlines and synclines. And that's when it, it's, it tends to buckle. So it's um, the, the entire length. So this piece of paper is uh, 12 inches but as I apply enough pressure and it folds onto itself, now that the entire length is maybe a third that. So the same amount of um, material is then folded on itself and it, that's actually shortened. So that's an example of when it, when it buckles. So if a layer is sheared, so remember again, that has, that's a different type of stress. Uh, when it's sheared, the layer uh, moves over another part and produces a fold. So if we were to see how, um, see how in this example down here, a point on this piece of paper, X and Y, if it's sheared, then it's folded like basically on top of each other. You can do the same type of thing uh, with a piece of paper as well. So this is, uh, this is where we see a lot of bends and curving um, in the subsurface. So when I just talked about the different composition of rocks and how they fold and form at different rates, it looks like foliation. And we've talked about foliation in the context of uh, metamorphic rocks, so it's similar. Um, but during uh, deformation, these internal changes take place to gradually modify the original shape and the arrangement of the grains. And in a tectonic setting, there is flattening and shearing of these ductile rocks and the presence of tectonic foliation in a rock indicates that the rock developed under um, straining conditions. So, so when we talk about foliation in metamorphic rocks, we're really looking at um, how internal grains change and, uh, and maybe the scale is a bit different than when we talk about tectonic foliation. And these are much larger structures. Um, we're talking about in the scale of tens of feet to hundreds of feet uh, or even larger when we when we look at anticlines and these synclines um, out in in the real world, these can be like huge structures that extend miles and miles and miles. Um, and so the scale is different when we talk about uh, tectonic foliation, much larger scale than when we talk about um, foliation uh, when we're looking at a rock sample. So it's the same process. It's just a slightly different scale. Okay, so let's talk about what causes mountain building. Because ultimately when we have um, these folds, typically that's where we see a lot of mountains being formed. So plate tectonics explains how mountains are built in convergent tectonic settings. So we're gonna look at some examples of where we see that in subduction, collision, continental rifting, and uh, how we measure those. So let's look at Mountains related to subduction. 
When we have ocean, uh, oceanic lithosphere, we have one plate that subducts and sinks beneath the other, like a, in a continental crust. So along the continental side, we have a lot of thrust vaults here. In this example here on the right, we have our oceanic plate going under the continental crust here, and we see a lot of these thrust faults. And the horizontal here, this line of where we see, in this case, it could be all the way down here. This, uh, this diagram has a few examples. But where these faults converge is called a detachment surface. And so the overall assemblage of this uh, system here is called a fold thrust belt. So we see the creation of mountains um, in this fold thrust belt system. And this surface where the uh, thrust faults all kind of converge, a horizontal surface here, that is called a detachment. OK, so what about collision? So when oceanic lithosphere between two blocks uh, of relatively buoyant crust subducts completely, the blocks had once been separated by an ocean, and now they collide with each other. Uh, this is through, uh, we see this over plate tectonic history. And uh, as these two collide that weren't, that were once separated by an ocean, this, uh, this is called a collisional origin. And the edge of one block slides up over the margin of the other. So in this diagram here, we can see how uh, these two converge um, and it, it creates this, um, this space between. So it, it shortens the block that's on top and therefore it raises up and creates a mountain range. And we see that today in the Zagros Mountains uh, near the border of Iran and Turkey. You can go check this out on an aerial image. It's pretty cool. So we see it happening today. OK, what about continental rifting? This occurs where continents are stretched and split in two. So we have a tensional stress. So the last example was compressional stress, where things are being pushed together. Here we have a tensional stress that causes normal faulting in the upper crust. Um, so this is where we have movement of normal faults that drop down the crust below. And sometimes it can tilt or move. And this results in uh, elongated mountain ranges. And so here we see that uh, we call this the detachment fault area, where that horizontal line is, uh, where all these faults converge. And it basically drops the block down. And um, because of this, we get these elongated mountain ranges. So let's take a look at the Sierra Nevada Mountains um, in Southern California. Well, I guess Central California. So what do you think about the formation of the Sierra Nevada Mountains? Does this map look a little different than what you've seen on some other maps? Well, that's because this map isn't of present day. So if we were to look at uh, this map here, this looks like Baja, California. Here's where the San Andreas Fault is, this like line right here. And this is roughly the Bay Area. And so you can see how everything's kind of crammed together. And that's because that's how the Sierra Nevada Mountains were formed. Today, we see uh, this is an image of Yosemite Valley. So based on the few examples that I just provided to you, how do you think the Sierra Nevada Mountains were formed using the hint of Yosemite Valley? Well, it has to do with uh, subduction of plates from 40 million years ago. And so that um, this photo here is from a, a, a reimagination, I guess, of, um, of Southern California or of California, the Pacific, um, about 40 million years ago. And what was happening in California 40 million years ago is the subduction of um, the Farallon plate. And so this image here on the left is a little bit difficult to read, but at the top is present day. And when we look at the plates of present day, we know that we have the North American plate and we have the Pacific plate. And to the north of us near um, Washington, we have the Juan de Fuca plate, but that wasn't what it was 40 million years ago. So 40 million years ago, we had the North American plate and we had the uh, Pacific plate. And before 
we had one major plate, which is called the Farallon plate. And as the Pacific plate came uh, and converged with the North American plate, the Farallon plate basically broke up into the Cocos or to the um, Juan de Fuca. But at the time, this was the Farallon. And so the Farallon, uh, the oceanic crust of the Farallon plate subducted with the uh, North American plate. And here is where we get the Sierra Nevadas. And if you've ever spent time in the Sierra Nevadas, uh, you might have noticed that um, uh, that you see a lot of basalt. And that's because the Sierra Nevadas are a uh, chain of volcanoes. So how do we know uh, how mountains are forming today? Um, well, we can measure them from GPS. So pre-GPS technology, they would be able to uh, have an idea of um, if the mountains are uh, getting taller based on indications of ancient beaches or uh, any other sea life and things like that. And you'd be able to have an indicator of relative um, sea level changes that way. But, but now we have GPS, uh, Global Positioning System, and this measures the rates, the actual rates of uplift and hor horizontal shortening. Uh, the example here on the right shows uh, how that is um, movement at these different locations. So the, the length, the stick basically of these indicates the velocity. So for the, um, we have the South American plate and the Nazca plate, and uh, generally it's moving sen seven centimeters per year, but we can see that um, it's not moving as quickly uh, further inland than it is closer to the plate. And we use that based on GPS positioning. All right, so let's talk a little bit about topography. So when we look at a map here, like this example here, this doesn't really tell us much about, well, how tall is tall? Um, how high are these mountains? And we use topography to describe that. So when we look at these two examples here, we have some steep looking mountains and we have some, uh, you know, a, a valley, a rolling valley. And can you tell the differences between the two? Um, probably just in this picture, you can intuitively say that, okay, well, this looks, these mountains look sharper, these look more rounded, um, but how would you express that in a map? And we do that using a topographic map. And if you're taking um, the lab portion of this class, then you'll have an experience to look at more topographic maps and, and do that. So uh, for this lecture, I'm just going to do a, a brief introduction of, of topographic maps. So let's see if we can draw the difference between the two. Um, so again, in topographic maps, we have our X space, our Y space, and then we translate that into the Z space. And when we're looking at these other examples of anticlines and synclines, we're looking at it in a Z space. We're looking at it um, if we were to slice through it. So topographic maps are a way to visualize three dimensions in a two-dimensional way. So the top image here is a topographic map. And these circles indicate relative uh, lines of topography or relative height. So if I were to walk along this line, this would be 20 feet along this line. And uh, if I were to walk along this circle here, it would be 40 feet along every point of this circle. And if we were to try to, to translate that, if, if I were to go from, if I were to walk across this structure from A to B, I would be going uphill and then I would dip down and then I would go uphill again and back down. And if we look at this profile, that's what it would look like. So if you've done any hiking, um, you might uh, check out what the relief of the hike is. So you know that if you're going to be climbing, you know, hundreds of feet on your hike, that would be important to know. So uh, we can also express topography with a geologic map. And we've, we've talked a little bit about geologic maps, which is a way to visualize what's happening beneath the surface. And we can use uh, these different layers to indicate uh, different geologic uh, units. And I did that just trying to show you the difference between synclines and anticlines. And if you have different geologic layers, they would appear differently on the surface. 
And uh, we can also combine topographic maps with a geologic map um, to show a geologic cross section. So here, if we were to look at a map view of, uh, of geologic units, this tells us something about what's happening beneath the surface. And if we were to project this down into a Z space, looking at a cross section, we would see that these beds are dipping. We see a structure here. This is uh, an anticlinal structure. And if we were to incorporate a topographic profile over A to B, we would see that uh, the, the topography is quite varied. And this has to do with maybe, um, you have an anticline that's created here, this dashed line and then you have erosional processes that occur, and this is our topographic profile. Uh, so we can kind of erase everything above that. And uh, this represents a combination of geologic map as well as a topographic map into a geologic cross-section. All right, so let's go over what we learned. We learned how and why rocks deform during mountain building. The characteristics of basic geologic structures and how, they, how we describe them. We had a different uh, lecture on faults, and today we talked more about folds and foli foliations. We talked about where and why mountain be belts form and what processes cause their uplift and how their formation relates to plate tectonics. And we looked at um, nature carves mountain ranges into rugged landscapes, and there's a difference between uh, steep mountains and rolling valleys. So that's it for this lecture.